Welcome once again to the Faith First Podcast. We are glad you have found us here today. We are a part of First Lutheran Church in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, a community of faith where we discover more together. My name is Pastor Craig Brown. I'll be your host for today. And this is episode 53 on May 9th, 2024. And you are in for a rare treat today. Our beloved Brett and Marita Woolgast, our musicians stopped by to the podcast today. They're not huge fans of talking out, but they came to me and said, hey, do you think we could talk on the podcast about our upcoming trip to Europe? And I said, yes, because we love you guys and we'd love to hear more about it. And we have a really fun time with them. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Also, Pastor Steve and I talk about the significance of Jesus choosing an outsider to reveal himself and what impact that might have on you and me and our call to be the best neighbors to people who may not look like us or act like us. And one of our star youth, Chloe, is here to lead us in prayer, and you are here along with us too, and we are so grateful for that. Let's go ahead and get things started and put our faith first. It's time once again for What's Brewing at First Lutheran Church. I have a couple of special guests with me today. Marita Wolgast, Dr. Brett Wolgast. How are you guys today? Fantastic. Thanks. I know uh, talking is one of your favorite things to do. So uh, (laughs) from the guy who plays organ. You know us well. Yeah. (laughs) And the woman who directs all our choirs. But I appreciate you guys making some time with us today. We're going to talk about your upcoming choir trip. What can you tell us about it, Marita? We were really excited when I brought this idea to the choir about a year ago to do a residency in England. I, everybody, I had many people who were just all in, 100% in, and that was so exciting to then go ahead with our plans. And we uh, worked with a company, and they had various cathedral options for us, and uh, we put in a couple of requests, and we got our our second, our second choice okay. cathedral to go to. Uh, was heading. the first Notre Dame or what? That's burn up. Uh, no, it was <laughs> Canterbury. Or no, Peterborough. Peterborough. That's yeah. right. So we're we're going to the Portsmouth Cathedral, which is uh, on the southern coast of England. But first, we'll be flying into London and spending a few days in London and touring around, and going to Westminster Abbey and. All of the wonderful sights and there, and then we'll head down to Portsmouth on the southern coast, and we'll be singing for three worship services there on the weekend of July 6th and 7th. And we will be singing a Saturday night even song, mm. and then a Sunday morning mass, and then a Sunday night even song. So you can imagine needing to have different repertoire for each of those services. We have a lot of music that we're working on right yeah, now and preparing, like <laughs> and the choir's doing great, and um, we had to get all this music approved by the cathedral. They have strict, <laughs> strict guidelines that you have to follow, and we sing various anthems, a setting of the mass. We have to sing two settings of the Magnificat and the Nuc Dimittis and some settings of Psalms. So, All in English? Or is there any Latin? Or? I'm pretty sure everything we're singing is in English. Makes it easy. Absolutely. So, yeah, we're kind of in the midst of all that preparation and we're just getting really, really excited to go. We have 30 singers going, 12 non-singers who are co- coming along to carry the luggage, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and then Brett and myself. And Brett will get to be playing the organ at mm-hmm. the Portsmouth Cathedral, um, wow. accompanying all of uh, the things that we sing for worship at those three worship services. Yep. Yeah, and as well as um, playing a prelude and a postlude and whatever hymns they tell us that we're going to have for those various services. So it be exciting. It found it interesting when we were first looking at this company. They sent us, you know, obviously material about the various churches, but then also about the various organs. And it's interesting in that it seemed like every cathedral had the same organ. I mean, it was almost verbatim in terms of how big it was, what stops it had on it. So I don't know if uh, Willis was a huge organ builder in the early 20th century, late 19th century in England. There must have been a surplus on 
Willis organs for cathedrals because they all seem to be, they're all four manuals, so they're actually larger than the instrument that we have here, and then all have pretty much the same kinds of sounds on them. So it'll be fun. Uh, this got to be like, what, top five experience for you? You oh played gosh. on some big boys. Uh, yeah, I've, I've played some instruments in Europe, uh, but not in England. I've never played on any in in the English cathedrals and played uh, several in Germany and Bach territory and that sort of thing. A lot of large instruments here in the United States. Um, but this this will be a new experience and then to actually play for an actual worship service. I've not really done that. Does he get giddy, Marita, when he plays on these organs? <laughs> oh, he, he's going to be in his version of heaven. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And my only concern is that we have such limited time practicing to, to actually get to know the instruments for yeah. the choir to get used to the rooms and you know that's that's going to be the challenge so obviously the the way to meet that challenge is to be extremely prepared before mm-hmm. you go so that's what we're working on yeah no one prepares more than, harder than you do brad oh. you're, you're, practicing, <laughs> you're practicing all the time and I, I know it would be a concern of yours to not be able to get in there and run through it a few times. And with the Germany trip, you're telling me, yeah, you just got in, got got a few minutes and get out. And Yeah. So, yeah, that I mean, that was similar. But that was just to play the instrument and have a little time with it. But this is for real, you know, real, yeah. real services. What are you looking forward to, Marita? Are you a Downtown Abbey fan? Downtown Abbey? Yeah. Oh, oh for sure. For sure. England is my bucket list. Mm. I've always wanted to go to England. And I've never been. And I have English. Oh, wow. I, I have English heritage. So that's why I... Uh, I'm really drawn to getting over there and seeing as much as we can. I'm excited about some of the music we're going to sing over there, too. We're singing a setting of the Magnificat and Nunc Dimittis by Simon Mould, who is a British Mm. composer. And this particular piece was commissioned probably 20 years ago by Rich Hoffman from Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Wow. Now, I don't know if you know that name, but a lot of people listening would know the name Rich Hoffman. He was a big church musician and, and a musician at Co. College, and he commissioned this uh, Simon Moult to write this uh, setting of the Magnificat and Nuc Dimittis for his church choir to sing here in the United States. Wow. And so it's going to kind of come full circle now. We're going to take that piece over to England and sing it over there. So I'm just really excited about that. Yeah, I can see the smile on your face is huge for this. What about you, Brad? Are you looking forward to any touristy thing? You're going to ride a double decker bus? Uh, I don't need to do that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Certainly the the Westminster Abbey, St. Paul Cathedral. We're going over into Wales, which I have not been. I have been to London and and seen several of those sites, but many, many years ago. And then following the tour, actually, Marita and I, this is our 40th anniversary year this summer. So we're actually staying over and for a few days and... Our middle son and his wife are actually going to be joining us, oh, and fun. then we're heading up into Scotland. I've always wanted to go to Edinburgh, Edinburgh, however you say that, um, and then we'll do some touring up there. I think we're going to try to get to the Roslyn Chapel, with the, which is sort of the Knights Templar and oh, uh, cool. that sort of— Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones folklore, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Marita actually is going to go see— um, she has a relative who was a famous poet um, in Scotland. Wow. Um, so we're going to go see some of the statues and things. Uh, I think that's outside of Glasgow, right? P- Paisley, Scotland. Paisley, Scotland. Well, who's going to be in charge on the way home? You're putting one of the choir members in? You bet. Yes. <laughs> they can watch each other. They, they, they are very self-reliant. They'll be fine. Well, that sounds like a lot of fun. 40 years of marriage. Yeah. We may have to have you on again on the podcast <laughs> to uh, tell us your secret of that. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> we're, we're about half of you. Katie and I just celebrated 20, so that seems like a long time. It's 40 years. Wow. Yeah. Well, we, we love you guys, and we're glad you still love each other, and I uh, hope you have the best time on this trip. I know you will. Yeah. Uh, you both deserve it, and I know it's a working trip. You'll be doing a lot of details, and anxiety will be up and all that to make sure everybody's safe, but I uh, hope you take some time to soak it in, too, and oh, yeah. know how much you're appreciated. Thanks for inviting us to do this, and mm-hmm. um, we're just looking forward to spending time with our choir and just sharing these special experiences with them. You do have some bonding that's going to happen on these trips oh, yeah. beyond the singing, just oh, uh, yeah. hanging out in the hotels and you bet. the side conversations. Um, 
that you build that community. I mean, you already have a strong sense of community in your music programs. This will just further that, right? Oh, you bet. Yeah. Absolutely. It's it's always a, a growing experience for everybody, and we're we're not the same when we come back. Mm. Uh, we're we're closer and and know each other that much better. So I'm sure it does something for your faith too. Oh, of course. To, yeah. Strengthen that. You bet. And to be in an Anglican situation, you know, with – so that'll that's a new experience for many people. Um, and even though it's not that much different from Lutheranism, um, there are some significant differences um, mm-hmm. just in terms of how the services run and so forth. So that'll be, that'll be a wonderful, eye-opening experience for all of us. When was your last trip like this? It was, what, 20, 25 years ago? The, the last time I took a choir to New York in 2013. And then before that, we took a choir to Scandinavia, Scandinavia in 1998. Yes, that's what I was thinking. So, yeah, it's yeah. been 25 years since we've traveled internationally with a singing group. Wow. Yeah. And then before that, we were in Germany and Austria and the Czech Republic. And that was early 90s. I suppose you're going to come back with heavy accents. We have to get, <laughs> <laughs> get that English accent yeah, out of you. Yeah, yeah. Or Scottish brogue. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you yeah. gonna bring, bring home a suitcase full of souvenirs? Or you got all your kids over there with you. You don't have to. Bring well, home anything. well, I have one um, middle son and, and wife. They're the only of our children, the only ones of our children that we haven't actually traveled internationally with. Okay. Um, so that was one of the reasons we invited them to join us over there. So, we'll have a stout beer for me and have a good time. Yeah. All right. Thanks for coming on, Will Gas. Yeah, you bet. And that's a look at what's brewing at First Lutheran Church. <laughs> It's time to dig into the Word. This is Pastor Steve Knudsen, and joining me today now is Pastor Craig. We're kind of switching seats, so you're the one that is on the uh, receiving end rather than the uh, directing end. So how are you doing? Good. I I preached on this series quite a bit. I don't think that was our intent uh, at the beginning. (laughs) We were trying to balance it, but I've enjoyed it. I think this is my third crack now at at, uh, Growing Young. This week's chapter is Be the Best Neighbors. And for the summary paragraph from the book that it gave us, it says, uh, demographics are changing in our country, and our younger generations are the most diverse in our nation's history. That's a huge statement. Our young people desire to see the church reflect the diversity of its community. They're also passionate about impacting the community and putting their faith into action so that those who are marginalized can experience the love of the church. Jesus showed us who is our neighbor and how we can neighbor well so that they experience the kingdom of God. So today, this week's story is uh, the woman at the well yes. and Jesus' first public proclamation of his messiahship. <laughs> And uh, he's told a few disciples, he's told people discreetly, but this was the first time where he publicly went outside of his circle and proclaimed himself the Messiah, the, the, the chosen one. He talked about living water and talked about how she would be included, and she didn't see that at first, and eventually she did, and then she runs off and she's telling everyone about this Messiah that has come for, for everybody. I kind of thought about you know how the story really begins with B- Jesus being a neighbor to a woman who had no neighbors. Yes. She comes to the well alone. He's already there. He is a Jew. She is a Samaritan. He's a man. She's a woman. There are all kinds of reasons for there to have been no conversation, no interchange, no neighborliness. Mm -hmm. And she didn't go to the well with the expectation she was going to talk to him. She was just going to get her water and go. In fact, she went in the middle of the day to not be around people. Right, because there's, of her background and her "quote unquote" sinfulness, and he here he is a holy man. There's another, you know, distinction. Yeah. We know that she didn't know that. Yeah. So Jesus sort of breaks through that. He's the one that starts the conversation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Makes a request, and it's by being, in a sense, a neighbor to her that opens up the doors to the conversation, to a fresh understanding of who he might be. And her own life changed. So going to that diversity and be the best neighbors, I think you and I kind of maybe have two different takes on that. My first blush is skin color. And the book mentions that we're becoming a majority non-white nation quickly. And that's new for us in the United States. We've always been majority white. And now we're becoming majority non-white. And the kids don't care. They don't care about us. My, my boys don't care a skin color nearly as much as I do. And I didn't care nearly as much as my parents did. And they didn't care, you know, as much as their 
I'll just say it, racist grandparents did. I mean, things are, are changing as the generations go down. And I think they want to see a church that reflects them in terms of you know the diversity of, of walks of life. Mm-hmm. But you, you were telling me earlier this morning when you had your men's group that you kind of broadened that out beyond just that one demographic, but it can mean a whole bunch of things of diversity. Yeah, I mean, there can be diversity of thought. There can be uh, diversity of socioeconomic backgrounds, diversity of belief. It was interesting. I uh, have a Bible study with uh, men of the congregation. We meet at uh, quarter to seven, seven o'clock in the morning. Anybody listening, you're invited to come and join us. No <laughs> pre-registration required. Just show yeah, up. There's your pitch. There's your pitch. Uh, <laughs> but uh, my question for them is, for your children and your grandchildren, they grow up and they're growing up uh, and they live in a very different world than you lived when yes. you were growing up. And uh, to invite them to kind of reflect on the conversations they've had with their children or grandchildren about how the world works and what does the world look like and how does that shape their views of life and of community, belonging, and what it means to be uh, the best neighbor, a good neighbor. We live in a country of such great diversity, and our children, our grandchildren inhabit that. As you say, you know, without even as much thought. I mean, it's just no. a given. Um, it's just a given. That's it's, exactly it's right. It's a given. I'll read you from the book here. There's a quote from uh, Soong Chang Ra, who is at North Park Theological Seminary. And Soong Chang says, The American church needs to face the inevitable and prepare for the next stage of her history. We are looking at a non-white majority, multi-ethnic American Christianity in the immediate future. Unfortunately, despite these drastic demographic changes, American evangelicalism remains enamored with an ecclesiology and a value system that reflect a dated and increasingly irrelevant cultural captivity and are disconnected from both a global and local reality. So what does that say to you? Those are a lot of big words. (laughs) There's a lot of big words in there. Um, How do you break that down? That's what I'm struggling with. <laughs> <laughs> Pause. <laughs> Deep breath. Uh huh. This is the material we got from growing young. They have some suggestions on sermons. And uh, this week it says Preacher, share a story of a time when you or someone in your community felt like, quote, the other or ostracized because of appearance or beliefs. Don't be afraid to be vulnerable. Share deep within. And this is optional. You can invite someone from the church who has an immigration story and ask them to focus how they have felt as the other. Mm-hmm. And I went, my mind went right back to those conversations we had. Was it two lengths ago where we had people of different walks? And um, Braulio Mendoza's story uh, sh- stuck with me, being an immigrant from Mexico, coming and building his own business and just making a life for himself here and having his whole family there. And when he was sharing that, it just was, you know, just floors you. It's just not our experience. Mm-hmm. Well, though it was our grandparents or great-grandparents' experience right. when they came over, for most of us, probably on the boat and had to start off uh, with nothing. It's within our family stories, though we forget them so quickly. And we're, again, we're majority white country coming over from white Europe where, you know, he's Hispanic yeah. coming into a situation that's, I mean, Iowa is 98% white mm-hmm. and or 95%. And then the ELCA is the whitest denomination in the United States. <laughs> so, and that's not a badge of honor. Uh, so how does one come into that? It would be totally different than how our ancestors came over into this situation. It's totally, totally different. And I think that's why the book encouraged us to, to share that. And the only story I could think of, and this just pretty weak, weak sauce compared to that, is that when I grew up in Fairfield, Iowa, southeast Iowa, it was a multicultural place. We had um, the Transcendental Meditation Movement from the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. He was out in California, and he, he meditated with the Beatles back in the 60s mm-hmm. and all that stuff. So he was out in California, and they bought Parsons College, which was a small school that went bankrupt in Fairfield. It went bankrupt in 72, sat empty for three years. In 75, they sent some scouts from California and said, oh, this is a peaceful, serene, small town in the middle of these cornfields. This will be great for our transcendental meditation movement. So they brought all these non-white people here. <laughs> yeah, you had quite an experience. Yeah, then. there was like 2,000 of them and all their families, and they meditated for two hours twice a day at um, you know like 7 to 9 in the morning, and then 5 to 7 p.m. there'd be this huge rush from downtown out to the – they built these two huge domes, and it was all strange to us white Midwestern folks. And there was just such a discriminatory nature towards them. 
in our town and from my parents and from other parents and grandparents. And it was, and the kids, we just didn't have that. I had kids that were, you know, meditating kids and kids that weren't in my neighborhood. And we all played GI Joes and star Wars together. We didn't, <laughs> you know, we didn't care. Uh-huh. And we knew our parents had these differences. How has the community changed over the years now? Well, the thing is you go back now today, that's a great question. Yeah. Next year will be 50 years since they've been there. They've transformed the community. I mean, first of all, a lot of little towns across Iowa just shriveled up and, and blew away like you know dust balls. But Fairfield's remained a, a pretty strong economic force. The downtown stayed lively and active with the arts. Uh, even the Des Moines Register at one point wrote an article about calling Fairfield the little Silicon Valley of, mm-hmm. of Iowa. And they have all these little startups because the meditating community, they're very smart, stereotypically. And they have a lot of startups and entrepreneurs, and they've, they've generated a lot of big businesses. Uh, mm. Books are fun. Reading is are fun. They have uh, telecommunications companies that have started there. Mm-hmm. And uh, it really transformed the city. And long story short, now you go back, and a lot of those divisions broke down. And now there's uh, a more kind of respectful synergy among the town people and and the meditating community. It's hard to tell one apart from the other. Sure, I, I'm not going to go there. It just seems so I, – I know the book suggests that, but it just seems so – a look at me. I had a hard experience growing up or I, I was I, – I understand yeah. something challenging. I don't. Right. This woman that came to the well, she she had an incredibly hard time. Um, she had a couple different husbands. She was ostracized from her community. She couldn't even drink – you know, go to get water for her family. Most of them went during the night when it was cooler. She had to go in the heat of the day. I mean, she was out on the island. She had no friends. She had no neighbors. And Jesus not only said, you know, you're okay how you are. I, I love you and accept you and forgive you for all those things. But he put her up on a pedestal, you know, saying that you you deserve, you know, God's grace. You, you, you're you part of the kingdom. You're not just on the outs of the society. You're, you're important to me and important to God. And she had not had anyone talk to her like that, Steve, ever. And so she races into town and says, this guy, you know, knew all this stuff about me and he loves me anyway. And, and she couldn't stop telling enough people. And I just think that when we, when we as Christians, when we receive Christ into our heart, I mean, it changes our lives. But when we go share Christ like this woman did with others, it changes the community. I think that's what the chapter for me is, that young people are drawn to churches that are willing to share Jesus' love in our words and our actions, regardless of who you are, regardless of your background, your race, your political affiliation, your beliefs, that you belong here, and we love you, and Jesus loves you. And churches that are willing to do that are growing young because they don't get hung up on those those differences. As we kind of explored the uh this chapter in the, the Bible study, I kind of asked some questions about, well, what does it mean for First Lutheran to be the best neighbor there in our go. community? That's what people want to know. You know, and there is, in part, you know, we have the some of those intentional acts of ministry at the doorstep to uh, our Saturday evening meals program to be present. We just, this uh, Wednesday at in the morning, the pastors of the congregations along 3rd Avenue, we gathered together for a time of prayer. It's not necessarily something with the whole congregation, but yet that does, you know, that spirit of fellowship, we're not across great differences because it's Presbyterians and Methodists (laughs) (laughs) and Lutherans, Uh, but yet still we're different congregations and yet, you know, uh, seeking to come together and mutually support one another, there's a spirit that way. And how do you extend that, you know, a spirit into the life of the whole congregation? It, It seems to me from the book is that people are looking for a place that can be true in its witness to the gospel, but generous in its regard for others. Mm. Uh, And how can you have a spirit of generosity uh, to other people so that they can feel a welcome? But more than just a welcome can be kind of patronizing. You know, being a neighbor is being willing, as Jesus said, to be in conversation, to be present to one another. Right. It's interesting in the in the gospel story. You know, Jesus says, "Give me a drink of water," and then she pushes him back. She says, "Why are you asking me for water? I mean, mm-hmm. this is the wrong conversation, buddy." Uh, and he could have said, "Okay, fine." Yeah, respect her you know, boundaries. Yeah, yeah, but, well, more than that, the, you know, just sort of like she was irked or whatever, and he just said, "Okay, I'm not gonna." He kept being present to her and radically he, present. Yeah, and engaging in the conversation. But even as the Lord and Messiah, he is still very human Mm -hmm. in in the way in which he is present to her. 
and invited her into a deeper conversation about God in the world, God in her life. But it all happened by just simply being present. And what's it say that God chose this outsider to be the first person to reveal his son to? I think it's important. It doesn't miss me that the first person that Jesus reveals himself to publicly is is someone that's not familiar to him. So that we we could see the prioritization of people outside of ourselves. I think that we, I think Christ was making a statement. He could have picked anyone to reveal himself. I don't think it was coincidence it just happened to be at that well and she happened to be there and I think it happened on purpose. Well, I mean, he revealed himself to Nicodemus for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Right, but Nicodemus was a Jewish leader. Right. Well, that was chapter three, so before chapter four. But there is something about, in terms of the signs, the ways in which Jesus makes himself known. It's the wedding at Cana, it's uh, Nicodemus, and now it's the woman at the well. Mm -hmm. Well, with the wedding, going back to that, I mean, he did a miracle. He did turn the water into wine, but he didn't really say who he was. And with Nicodemus, he talked in vague terms about, you know, the Son of Man coming. But with the Samaritan woman, he said, the Messiah, stand in your midst. I am he. Mm -hmm. He proclaimed himself to be God. And he chose that woman, I think, outside of the Jewish faith and outside of the whole everything. I mean, she couldn't be more outside of of society. And I think Christ did that, that we're supposed to do that as well. What does it mean for us at First Lutheran? What are terribly white and are... Uh, very affluent, is to find people that are not like us. We have a lot of people, Pastor Steve, coming through our doors who are non-white. We are blessed that way as a congregation. We have some Hispanic families coming now. I want to get to know them because I think it's important for us to make sure that they know that they're fully included, that this church is for them. What does it mean to be authentically oneself but yet also authentically connected? And I think that's what Jesus did in the story. Absolutely. Uh, he just said, now tell me about yourself. And he in, invited in conversation with her. He know, was willing to t- take a drink of water with her. Yeah. He was willing to share from the same well. Yeah. He, he, she, her sinfulness didn't poison him to where I can't, well, we can't and, be at and, the same table. And, or and, and actually for them, it would because she was a Samaritan, uh, that would have been as big a difference. You know, she's. It's interesting, the thing she asked is, you know, why are you a Jew asking me a Samaritan? She didn't say, why are you a man asking me a woman or mm-hmm. why are you, you know, whatever. It, she went to that sort of racial or uh, ethical differences or yeah. sociological differences right. that were so defining in those days. Hard for us to get a sense of what that, how different that was for them. She could see it right away. She, I mean, uh, whatever that was that she knew, she knew that you're not like me and I'm not like you and right. we shouldn't be talking and you're, you're asking. Uh, He broke through that. The similarity to me would be serving at Semp. Are you willing to go on the other side of the counter and go sit down and have dinner with someone? I've done that. It's different than serving them and keeping that boundary of the counter between you. Or someone in church that uh, comes in off the street and sits in the back, are you willing to go and sit with them so they don't have to sit alone? We have people in our church that just do that. We don't have a ministry that looks out for those people. We probably should. We we rely on, right, we have enough good-hearted Christians that they're going to go over and make that person feel welcome. And that's, I think, the call for us today. How do we include those people? How do we know that they're included, that they feel included and loved mm-hmm. and part of this thing? To be the best neighbor, being neighborly, is it's more a spirit of a place, the feeling of a place, than just think simply the doing or whatever. I mean, you can do all kinds of things, but if you don't have that spirit of neighborliness, right. it doesn't mean anything. So, I, If your heart's not right. Yeah, yeah. Well, you've got uh, <laughs> being the best neighbor, and it's easy when everybody's the same. What does it mean to be the best neighbor into a neighborhood of difference? And you can cut that difference in a variety of ways. As you say, you know, it could be uh, racial or ethnic in background. It could be show, socioeconomic, mm-hmm. an intersection of the two. There are all kinds of ways in which, you know, difference might be lived. You know, there can be difference simply of political affiliation and, you know, how you look at the world that way. That's cutting our churches left and right. Yeah. And unfortunately, churches on both sides are saying, listen, you have to agree with this or you can't One be a part of it. Yeah. We at our church say we're big enough where we can set aside those differences and focus on the salvation through Christ for, for all people. And we can agree to disagree on the rest. And I, I'm, I'm proud of our church that we have people from all sides of the political spectrum. You know, speaking about being the best neighbor, a number of years ago, I went with a group of people to Tanzania, and we were at a Maasai uh, church uh, out in the country. 
and a very traditional tribe or gathering of people. And it was beautiful music as we came in. And by, especially what I remember is the pastor, the Maasai pastor of that congregation. And he stood up and he said, now look at this. Look at these strange people who are dressed strangely. He's talking to us, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, who come from a strange place way over, you know, across the ocean. I mean, we were the other. And he said, yet, yeah, you know, there's something beautiful here because even for all our difference, uh, we have one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And he was able in a beautiful way both to capture sort of the difference mm-hmm. uh, and yet a spirit in which we might be neighbors with one another without having to, we weren't going to dress as Maasai, they were not going to dress as Iowans, but that there was something more fundamental, you know, being a child of God, uh, loved by Christ, uh, that... Wow, the guy got it. So... Good good word to end on. Okay, well, that is uh, Digging Into the Word uh, with Pastor Craig Brown, and you can hear him uh, Sunday at uh, 9 and 11 o'clock here. Not, Not at 9. Oh, that's correct. We have, oh, a, children's, we have a children's correct. musical. Yeah, this Sunday uh, we have a children's musical at 9. But uh, Pastor Craig will be preaching at 11. Also Saturday uh, you can come here, First Lutheran at the 3rd and 10th Street in southeast Iowa, uh, southeast Cedar Rapids, I should say. Always it's catch great. it on YouTube later, too. You can always catch it on mm-hmm. YouTube, yeah. So thank you very much, Pastor Craig, and uh, let's dig it into the Word. Hi, my name is Chloe, and I'm happy to pray with you today. Almighty God, Send your church out into the world to spread your love and joy. Help us to reflect mercy toward the people outside our church walls by adhering to the example set by Jesus in the story of the woman at the well. Guide us to be the best neighbors to everyone around us with Christ's compassion in our hearts. Help us neighbor well by honoring what's good and making our world better. Use us as your vessels to revive your creation, that habitats and every kind of living thing might flourish. Protect endangered species and help us to care for all your creatures. Lord, lead us to respect our journey here on earth as much as our final destination. Grant wisdom and vision to world leaders that they may seek justice, peace, and the good of all living. Strengthen international partnerships and cooperation to help bring an end to all war. Be with all young people and emerging adults as we explore our future callings and places of work. Guide our entire church to be a mentoring community that helps all discover their part in your mission to become good neighbors to the world around us. We ask for your comfort for all those who suffer, especially those afflicted by anxiety, depression, and mental illness. Be with our friends and family in the hospital and help us to be conduits of your love and our care for one another. Your blessed saints now rest in you. Give us thankful hearts for those who have gone before us. Lead us to put our daily trust in you for our life and well-being every day here on earth and beyond. Into your hands, most merciful God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your abiding love through Jesus Christ, our resurrected and living Lord. Amen. Thank you, Chloe, for those prayers. You did a great job. We've appreciated and enjoyed all of our youth during this time that have led us in prayer and lead us in all kinds of ways in our church. Um, You guys are rock stars. We thank you for being a part of our church family. Hey, a great big week coming up this coming week. Wow, we have got a lot on our plate, and it's going to be exciting. If you're going to be around, please join us in person or online. Um, I'm talking about May 18th and 19th. We celebrate with all of our high school seniors from all the various schools that we draw from here at First Lutheran. So come celebrate with them. It's always great to read their profiles and and hear what they're up to. And just so proud of our young people and their accomplishments. We're also going to be doing our celebration of baptism. We've invited by invitation all the people who've been baptized, adults, children, over the past year plus to come back and celebrate with them. We have a special gift uh, Pastor Katie came up with to give them. And then we're just going to kind of open the font again. We did this about a year ago and said, hey, if anyone wants to come forward and be baptized, um, please come to the water. And we had, I think, 13 people 
that first time come. No expectations this time, but uh, we just want to open up again. If there's any kids that want baptized, you maybe haven't had a chance to do it since COVID or just you feeling led to come up yourself as an adult or a family member, bring them along this next coming weekend, May 18th, 19th, and just see how the Spirit may move in their lives. And finally, we're also putting together our action plan around our Growing Young initiative, how our church might engage young people and young adults, how we might uh, begin to look at changes that we need to make in ourselves as older adults and, and as our congregation so that we can make this the most friendly place for youth that we can be a church that is growing young. So that's going to happen at uh, 10 a.m. on Sunday, May 19th. Michael Beckman is going to be leading us that, gathering up all of our thoughts from our 100 plus people that have been in small groups and your thoughts as well. You have listened to the podcast. I know God has been working on your heart, so come and join us for that. And we'll have some great conversations, discussions, hear some suggestions, throw a lot of stuff out there and see um, the, the beginnings of how God might be uh, moving our congregation that direction. So a lot going on next week, and we appreciate you being with us along here on the podcast, and we look forward to talking with you again next time. Until then, remember to be courageous, go out there, be the best neighbors, and put your faith first.